Hello, this is Peter Pickett of Pickett Brass and Blackburn Trumpets. I'm here today to give you a little bit of history on Pickett Brass and Blackburn, where we came from and how we got to where we are, and then also speak to a little bit of how we make mouthpieces here at Pickett Brass, as well as a lot of the trumpet history and legacy that we inherited from Cliff Blackburn and how we're carrying that forward, and to give everybody a little bit of a sense on, on what goes into it. If you ever have a chance to visit a uh, manufacturer of any size, you should absolutely take advantage of it. It provides a lot of valuable insight and appreciation for what goes into uh, the music and the art that we all create and is invaluable for yourself as well as uh, your friends and students and such. So our goal here today is to share a little bit about that with you in case you're not able to visit anytime soon uh, throughout this time. So again, I'm Peter and we're, today we're going to talk about mouthpiece and trumpet manufacturing. First, we're going to go over a little bit of where we came from and how it got started. Picket Brass is relatively new, and uh, also talk about our manufacturing, like I said, and then continue with our products and talk about the specifics and design aspects in general, and then talk about trumpets. As with a lot of startups, this was a very small in the garage behind my house. And this was the very first shop back in 2003, maybe a little bit before. Um, it was a mess. It was full of all sorts of stuff. But it's where we started by manufacturing trim kits. So that includes buttons, brass buttons, aluminum buttons, brass and aluminum stems of all sorts of weights and sizes, as well as top and bottom caps. This started mostly as an aesthetic exercise, just changing the look from a traditional horn to a more modern look. And I found that it, it did, of course, change the sound and the playing characteristics of trumpets. So from an empirical or experimental approach, this was really just the start. Although my master's thesis was in acoustics and modeling the airstream and the sound column of a trumpet, I did not apply that to this because that all, like I said, only dealt with the airstream and not so much the, the physics and the interaction with the body, which we all know is important. In the beginning, we were making them by hand on a manual lathe, but we had quickly gotten to a, a small CNC or a computer numerical control setup. This provided a little bit more robustness, a little bit more consistency for me, and allowed us to expand out to multiple trumpet models and, and sizes and different designs uh, pretty easily from the beginning. Once we had mastered a lot of the trim kits, and, and frankly, I lost a little bit of interest making buttons, although it was kind of fun while it lasted there, we started making mouthpieces. And these were the, this is a picture of the very first mouthpiece tops that uh, I'd made on a new machine that we moved into that same little tiny shop in the back of my house. Uh, that shop was about 300 square feet, and you could fit one person in there, maybe one and a half people once we got this machine moved in and all the rest of the stuff that we had in there. But everything has a start. And so by making these parts here and getting those out to the one of the first national trumpet competition shows that we went to and, and seeing what the response was from our extensive inventory of 12 mouthpieces that we brought with us, um, we were able to iterate quickly and continue on the design changes and different options that we have today. But that started in 2007, and uh, given that I'm a trumpet player, that was a natural place to start. But after our, our size grew and the machine and that tiny shop were not quite sufficient, we moved to a new place, still behind my house kind of, uh, kind of model. It was a beautiful piece of farmland looking out over acres and acres of cattle, and so it was really pretty and wonderful to go out to in the mornings. We moved this machine though in, this machine weighs 10,000 pounds, and the issue was we had no paved access to this shop. And so it took about two days to move that machine uh, across a field and, and into this shop. And we didn't have three-phase power to run it, so that was another couple of weeks. So there was a lot of growing pains to scale to a machine of this size, but this machine, even though it was overkill for making trumpet mouthpieces and trumpet backboards and such, it was ideally suited to me making trombone and then ultimately tuba mouthpieces, one piece and two piece and three piece versions. And so by taking that risk and uh, jumping up to a larger machine and a larger shop, it did provide us the opportunity to grow into the other markets as we went. 
That shop, is, is, although it was 1,000 square feet, three times larger than what we had started in or what I started in in 2003, it also quickly uh, was outgrown. So we finally moved to the space that we're in today, uh, probably uh, 2012, I think is what it was. And the space that we're in today is about five or 6,000 square feet. And so uh, once again, a large step up. But now we have not only manufacturing, but we also have a dedicated shipping and receiving location so that parts stay clean and our packing materials stay clean and it can stay organized. And we also have a showroom and so we can have a nice sounding quiet room to play in uh, and for people to listen. It makes for evaluating mouthpieces as well as trumpets a lot more comfortable, a lot more enjoyable. Also, last year, we were able to take the Blackburn trumpet side of things and expand it into its own space. And this has provided an opportunity for a much more relaxed atmosphere now instead of being in a, a very cramped, piled-in uh, space. And so this has been a great boon to capacity as well as uh, future expansion now that we can uh, have room for our elbows. So I want to start with first how we make mouthpieces. I believe in efficient processes uh, for the sake of not only taking less time overall, but also for repeatability and consistency. Uh, those, are very, those are two very important characteristics that I feel uh, are, are required for a, a long-lasting or longevity of a brand and designs. So process efficiency uh, being one of the most important things that we do here. Then I'd like to talk about the tooling processes and tooling and processes that we put together in order to make our mouthpieces here from start to finish. And then we can talk about um, a little bit more of the processes that we do. The first place that we start with is with software. The mouthpieces that I had started with in the very beginning in 2007 were never made by hand and then reverse engineered. And so they were all initially drawn in our in-house CAD and CAM software. And then that way we can provide digital iterations, meaning if I make a mouthpiece for you and you say, I'd like something different, well, we digitally change it, produce another one, and we can keep going down that rabbit hole, one, two, three, four, five. But if you say, you know, I don't think we're going in the right direction, and I'd like to go back to, say, number two, well, digitally we can go back to number two and iterate from that point. That process of iteration and evaluation, uh, experimental evaluation, has been crucial to developing quickly uh, with real-world testing. Empirical testing is really what it comes down to. Although my master's thesis helped prove out uh, multiple predictions through mathematical modeling of mouthpieces and trumpets, at the end of the day, you have to make it and put it on your face to see how your body, uh, your chest cavity, all that interacts with the mouthpiece and the horn in order to find out how it works and how it sounds and how you experience it. So the software provides a starting point for that. It provides a bookkeeping aspect to it, as well as all of the mechanical parameters and such in order to produce the designs. This also helps make our manufacturing process robust because the CAM software ensures that we have robust tooling paths, it doesn't overstress the machine, it doesn't overstress the tools, so that we have day-to-day -day operation uh, continuity. The first approach to cutting mouthpieces would be to use a form tool. Form tools have been used for centuries in order to cut complex patterns into wood and metal and other materials. Its approach is extremely robust, uh, it's extremely repeatable and very accurate as long as you take care of your tools. And so this has been used for, like I said, a long time. And so it makes perfect sense to cut rim and a cup as well as backboards using form tools. A picture here from Bob Reeves shows cutting a cup and a rim using a form tool. It's incredibly efficient and it's incredibly accurate and it's incredibly repeatable. And so it makes perfect sense and it's a great approach to cutting these. The problem I had at the beginning is I did not have a design in mind, and so it didn't make sense for me to invest in form tools and the expensive steel in order to produce a design that I really didn't know what I liked yet. And so, very beginning, we started by using single point cutting. Now, single point cutting is very much that. It takes a single point and it draws basically the shape that you want, and so it's like a knife through butter. You can move that knife up and down and you can get arbitrary shapes with a single tool. 
That tool in the upper right-hand corner there is uh, a three-sided, uh, what's called an insert, and basically three points of cutting. So if one wears out or you break it, you can just rotate that insert around and get another one. So it's like three cutters in one. And on the left-hand side there, you see us cutting a outside profile early on, and we're using a single point cutter there. It's a little bit bigger of a point on the front of that, but we basically trace it through the profile that we want. And if we want to change that profile, it's just a software change as opposed to having to go make a new form cutter. And again, that was really out of the efficiency of iteration at the beginning where we did not have a design in mind and we needed an easy and efficient way in order to iterate. And I believe that iteration is key to coming up with a design for a player, listening to how they play, listening to what they say, listening to what they're hearing on their side of the horn versus what everybody else hears on the, on the outside of the horn, and then iterating and listening and basically taking a walk, taking a journey with them in order to come up with something that works for them uh, and gives them what they're looking for on their musical journey. The next thing that we had to do was to mark our mouthpieces. And so, of course, after you iterate through dozens and dozens of mouthpieces, the Sharpie that we had initially written on the mouthpiece comes off. And then you're stuck because you don't really know which one is which. So clearly early on we, we figured that out that we needed to mark. And the majority of, of metal marking is through a stamp. A stamp is like taking your thumb and pushing it into a stick of butter. The material squooshes out and you're left with a mark. So that mark in the bottom right hand corner there is an example of writing B2227. It's probably a serial number or a date code and it's very fast, it's very efficient, and it's very robust. You know, stamps don't come off easily of a mouthpiece without cutting or very, very heavy finishing. So that's how we started. We had a number set for serializing our iterations, and we had a roll stamp, which I'll show in just a second, for writing the brand name on there. This was a, a wonderful way to get into it, uh, although, as you can imagine, stamping is very difficult because you're moving, you're moving the metal in order to leave an impression of what you want. So here is a video of early on mouthpieces where we were making a mouthpiece top. This cutter here is a single point cutter. And so we go through and we do a roughing operation such that we remove the majority of the metal. And this is in real time and you can, you can see how powerful it is to, in order to remove a lot of material very quickly. And then for our finish pass here, we're going very slowly in order to get a good surface finish. And like I mentioned before, that tool is following a computer program to give that particular shape. Now here's the roll stamp. So that stamp in the upper part of the screen there, that's got our brand on it, Picket Brass, and what we're doing is we're bringing it up very slowly to the part and that roll will engage and then it will impinge the letters onto the mouthpiece. Here we go and we just finish it up in order to take that little squooshed portion that, that we squooshed out with the stamp and cutting it off. So again, this tool is following a predetermined path. It doesn't rely on a form tool in order to tell it where to go. So this shape that we came out with uh, early on was a nice middle of the road weight. It wasn't too heavy, it wasn't too light, and it fit the majority of our customers at the time. We have since adapted that to multiple weights, but again, the single point turning gives you the ability to adjust to that. The next operation here is as a pilot hole. It's the hole through the center of the mouthpiece in order just to remove the material. Now something that may not make sense is the drill is not moving here. Most of us are used to using a power drill where the drill is rotating and what we're drilling into is not moving. Whereas with a lathe, the material is moving. So that's spinning at 4,000 RPM and that drill is being brought up against it, but the drill's not moving. So same here with these cutters. The material is rotating, the cutter is standing still. Here we're cutting the pocket for threading and threaded back bores. Early on, uh, Terry Warburton and I were good friends, and so we decided, I decided to use the 3 8 40 threads. Uh, at the time, I was playing some Warburton mouthpieces, and so it made sense to use a lot of those, those parts that I had in hand uh, in order for testing. So at this point, we have a mouthpiece blank. So it's threaded such that it will accept back bores. It's got the brand written on it, and it's got the outside blank. At this point, we would take that off and then go cut the cup on a separate system, a separate setup, uh, same, same general concept. 
The challenge with the uh, roll stamp engraving is that in order to get something different written on the mouthpiece, you had to get another piece of steel. Much like the form tools, you had to go make a whole other piece of steel. So if somebody wanted their name written on the mouthpiece or we came up with a new model designation, we would have to go get another piece of steel in order to cut those uh, letters or numbers. Or we could hand stamp. And frankly, I've never been very good at hand stamping. And so I didn't like the way it looked uh, or how that came out. So what we've moved to is honestly a slower operation where we engrave. So what we see in this picture is a teeny tiny engraver there that's rotating and it's cutting those letters and uh, numbers and name or whatever into the brass. So it's removing material. It's not moving material like a stamp. It's removing. So that approach generalizes uh, our ability to name mouthpieces, our ability to write on mouthpieces, to customize without any further tooling investments. Um, so I believe in that process efficiency, that process flexibility, and uh, able to adapt. So this is the process together that we follow today. So we have single point cutting again in order to get the profile that we want. We're going to come in and we're going to drill the same pilot hole through the middle, just clearing out material because no mouthpiece has a solid, solid center through it. Uh, so this drill opens that up and gives a place for everything else to cut. Next, we're going to go cut the pocket for those threads so that we can accept back bores from a variety of manufacturers. That's been proven to be a nice way to adapt to what a customer has or what they are used to. In this case, though, we're going to do a, a rigid tap. So that's actually a, a cutter that cuts the threads very efficiently there. Now it's done. And we're going to go back and we're going to finish the outside profile with a very sharp tool to get very fine detail and a very good surface finish. Next, instead of the roll stamping in order to mark it, we're going to go machine or engrave that name, Picket 3C, into the outside of this mouthpiece. So you'll notice that this takes much longer than a roll stamp, which is nearly instantaneous. But if we decide to, to change the nomenclature or we needed to write something extra on a mouthpiece for somebody, or if we wanted to write serial numbers, things like that, now have a way to get in there very efficiently. Also, since the mouthpiece is marked once it's made, uh, we don't have the risk of mismarking a mouthpiece. The next process, like I said, was to take this blank and to cut it off. The machines that we utilize are basically two in one. They have a subspindle, so it's basically a lathe on one side and a lathe on the other side. Here we are cutting it off and transferring it to that other machine. And so moving over, you see that the inside of this mouthpiece blank is solid, of course, since we haven't cut it. There we cut the outside of the rim with a single point turn and then we use a small boring bar and we go in and we cut the inside of that cup as well. And so therefore the, the rim and the outside as well as the cup can all be customized and adjusted as necessary without having to get a whole new piece of form tool. And that's been very efficient and uh, very flexible as we've gone through. And then once it's done on the right hand side of our machine, we have a completed mouthpiece that is correctly marked and is single point turned for maximum flexibility in manufacturing process. It's not the fastest, but it provides us the most efficient way to iterate and to adjust and to adapt to the ever-changing needs of players as we go. Next, let's talk about some of the mouthpiece design aspects that we've all heard tidbits about and everybody, of course, has an opinion on each one. But there are some general guidelines and tendencies that make sense um, and that you can look for in, in any design. So the mouthpiece has usually been broken down into a rim, a cup, a throat, a backbore, and then the blank. And that provides us a jumping off point here to, to talk about each one of those. The rim is something that we probably talk about the most because it's, it's what we feel, it's what we see, uh, and, and oftentimes it's probably the most controversial. Should you have a round or a flat one? Should you have a wide or a thin one? Should you have a sharp bite? Uh, so on and so forth. So basically all of this determines how it feels on your face. And much like a pair of shoes, it has to feel comfortable at some level or else you're going to dread playing every day. And so we believe in having a comfortable rim that is a little bit flatter 
than maybe most, but not so flat that it does limit your flexibility. A large flat rim can clamp down your face such that your embouchure is not able to move as quickly. And so there's a little bit of a compromise from that comfort to that flexibility. But I believe in the comfort such that it's a pleasant experience and it's not painful and it doesn't get in the way of your plane. Where that leads, that rim leads around into the cup is what we call the bite. And so that bite leads into the cup and the cup and that bite determine not only the articulation and the response of a mouthpiece, but also the majority of where the sound is designed in how we approach making mouthpieces. I believe in a sharp bite because I have seen it affect people's articulation in a very positive way. Folks that have a thuddy attack that, that need a little bit more response, a little bit more immediacy in the sound, you can usually find that in their bite on their mouthpiece that's too, uh, too rounded or too soft. And so our stock designs all on the shelf have very sharp bites by most conventions. And I believe that that uh, contributes to a much faster articulation and response. Now, of course, that can be taken too far. We can make a razor sharp edge bite that will make you bleed and your articulations will be very great, but they won't be for very long because you'll, you'll get cut. So obviously it comes back to what I said on the flat rim, having some level of comfort such that it is uh, a joy to play and fun to get the response um, and the feeling is, is comfortable. Now, like I said, that bite goes into the cup. Uh, our design is a continuous curve design, I believe in having no discontinuities in that shape. Uh, that provides acoustic reflections or uh, other kind of discontinuous uh, acoustic responses. And that comes into the cup. And we've seen different cup designs through the years, of course, uh, bowls or Vs or square cups or, or deep Vs or shallow Vs, all somewhat arbitrary nomenclature for, for designs that go between um, big volume and low volume cups. In general, a bowl is, uh, it provides a much fuller sound, but it also requires the most effort to keep all that sound and, uh, and the articulations and stuff together. Having a little bit more shallow cup where when you're adding resistance to this part of the mouthpiece can help in terms of support and efficiency such that you're not so constricted in your throat or your shoulders or your oral cavity. And so having the right amount of resistance, we'll talk about more in the throat and the back bore, provides, uh, like I said, efficiency, provides comfort. It helps match the impedance or the resistance of a horn, mouthpiece horn system, to the player. Not everybody requires the same amount of resistance or finds the same amount of resistance comfortable. So going back to the shape of the mouthpiece cup here, we have not only the sound that we can design into it, whether it's a brighter sound or a darker sound or a mellower sound through a more V cup, a deeper V cup. Think about like a, a flugelhorn mouthpiece. That cup volume and that cup shape is where we can adjust the sound. And as you look through uh, other manufacturers, you'll see all of these variations for exactly the same reason. You can get big sounds through a big cup. You can get brighter sounds and more resistance through shallow cups, shallow Vs, things of that nature. So the cup then leads into the throat and the back bore. So the throat, of course, is the, the smallest diameter hole in the mouthpiece that you, can, that you can see. And that leads into the back bore, which is, is simply the transition from the throat out to the end of the mouthpiece into the lead pipe venturi. This is where we here at Picket Brass use uh, to adjust the resistance. And people have a, a very good horn that they like, and they have a mouthpiece sound that they like, and they have a rim that's comfortable, but something's not working. Oftentimes it's a resistance change. And so we can change the throat size and the back bore size or volume in order to adjust that resistance. Now that's not the only thing that those two components contribute. So having a throat that's very, very small, yes, can provide a lot of efficiency because it's, think of it as a constriction. You're blowing through a smaller hole. It can provide that resistance that's needed. But the throat and the backboard can contribute heavily to intonation. So having a very long, narrow throat can stretch out harmonics on a horn and vice versa. A backboard can contribute to the sound. Now I said earlier that our cups and a mouthpiece typically control most of the sound, which is true. But the backbore volume can also contribute to shaping the harmonic structure that the mouthpiece is producing for you. 
having a very constricted, narrow back bore not only has more resistance, but it's also a little more strident. Whereas having a large, more open back bore that, that flares more quickly and has more overall volume can change the harmonic structure of what's created. And of course, all of this affects intonation. So it's a balance. Just because a cup is good and the back bore is, is technically what you want in terms of, say, sound, it does not mean that those two components will work together. So it has to be a balance. So sometimes when a cup is made more shallow or a throat is made smaller, you are reducing the volume in a mouthpiece and therefore you have to compensate by making the back bore a larger volume. And as a result, your intonation stays more consistent across different types of mouthpieces that you play. So the balance of the rim, the bite, the cup, the throat, and the back bore all contribute to how well a mouthpiece plays for you, what it sounds like for you, and of course intonation with the horn that you're playing. Now the thing that we see on the outside then, of course, is the blank. And a lot of times people want a traditional blank because it's what they've always visually seen. It's not to say that any one blank is ideal or perfect or perfectly balanced or, or what have you, but rather, again, having the effect of the mouthpiece weight being different and trying it. This, again, heavily depends on the horn that you're playing and what kind of player you are physically in your oral cavity and your chest cavity. Now, we make a standard blank, I guess you could say. It's probably a little bit heavier than a traditional blank, but not by much. And so the response physically and response acoustically is very similar to that. We have made a number of heavy blanks in order to remove some of the sensation that you get when you play uh, on a mouthpiece. It's not vibrating as much. You're not losing as much energy in the, in the material itself because it's not as, as thin and resonating. And as a result, you change the harmonic structure of the sound. Now, whether that's good or bad is up to the player and the listener. And so that's, uh, again, a personal preference in my opinion. On the shank, we should probably talk about the gap. Uh, going back to the Bob Reeves system where he has had a sleeve system for years and years, it makes perfect sense because at the end of a mouthpiece, you suddenly have a diameter difference between the, uh, where the backbore exits and then before you get to the lead pipe. And so you have to make sure that that gap is one that works for you. And the reason I didn't say you have to have a gap or you have to have no gap is it comes down to personal preference. Reynolds Schilke believed in zero gap for a long time. And so going down to a zero gap, a horn plays completely different than if you have maybe about 0.1 or 0.125 or, or an eighth of an inch gap. That's what we find works for most people. It gives the response and the immediacy that they've expected uh, and, and the response and intonation that's also expected. But again, this is up to the player to decide. And so the Reeve system for adjusting that gap is, is crucial for that iteration. We make mouthpieces cut for those sleeves and we make mouthpieces with a number of different gaps in order to fit somebody's horn or to fit their style of playing. The last thing that we should talk about on mouthpieces is construction. Like you saw in the first couple of manufacturing videos, we were making individual mouthpiece tops that required a screw on back bore. And there's a cross section showing how those, those screw threads interact. This was again at the beginning due to the fact that we didn't know exactly where we wanted to go on our designs and it provided us the maximum flexibility. I believe in the empirical testing such that you get the feedback directly from a player or even as the player in order to adapt and so by having a two-piece system or a three-piece system it allowed us to adjust and to experiment very efficiently very quickly in order to come up with new concepts instead of the uh, inefficiency of having to make individual one-piece mouthpiece models for every possible combination. So when you see this at an ITG conference in person, you will see that we have a number of options for both backboards and mouthpiece tops, whether it's trombone or, or trumpet even. And this provides us a, an ability to really listen to a player and to find the best possible combination from the tens of thousands of combinations that we can produce and not having so many combinations that we are lost in the weeds. And so through the, through the last 10 years, we've found that we have a good combination of pieces and parts, different designs, we've introduced some additional designs, and it provides us a wonderful palette to work from in order to listen and adapt and to help players on their musical journey. 
So the next thing I'd like to talk about is Blackburn Trumpets. Blackburn Trumpets is something very special. Started by Cliff Blackburn in the early 80s, working on lead pipes while he was playing in the Louisville Orchestra, and then eventually turning into full Blackburn Trumpets uh, after partnering with Bill Cardwell, and coming up with a great scientific-based, uh, acoustic-based design for not only the bells, the throat, and the flare, but also the rest of the horn coupled with great traditional fabrication. Cliff was in a teeny tiny shop in, uh, in Louisville and then eventually moved back to Tennessee. And he is the epitome of efficiency and doing uh, what needs to be done with the tools that he has in hand. So his approach to fabrication and, and building a horns has resulted in such a wonderful and unique instrument that has been enjoyed by, by a number of people through history. And so when Cliff and I were, were talking at uh, ITG in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a while ago, Cliff was talking about retiring. And immediately I knew that we needed to carry on that legacy and that tradition that Cliff and William Cardwell started and then further develop it into, into what it can become. So we acquired them in 2016, and we moved machinery and trumpets and designs and tools and stuff up to our Lexington shop here and have continued along. So what we're going to talk about here is how, how we make the horns, how we believe uh, the horns come together well and result in, again, what Cliff started and what we are continuing to produce uh, with, uh, with Blackburn trumpets. So we'll talk about uh, the horn as we go through. We obviously started with the mouthpiece, but so we'll talk about the lead pipe, valve sections, the making of the bell, and then bringing it all together. The lead pipe, in our case, is made from a drawn tube. And so what you'll see here is this is a cylindrical piece of tubing, and it's being pulled through a compliant die on down to a mandrel, which is the steel in the middle. That steel was designed and cut by Cliff from his early days playing in the Louisville Symphony, like I said earlier, in order to provide the intonation and the response that he wanted at the time. That lead pipe provides an incredible amount of influence on how a horn plays. And throughout the years, Cliff has manufactured and sold a number of lead pipes for other people's horns, mainly box strads and Yamahas, as well as a number of piccolo trumpets. Because just changing that one aspect of a horn can change the character. And so for someone who's looking for a different response or a different sound can make a, sp a small investment, a small change, and make a huge uh, resulting change in how they sound and how they feel. So that lead pipe being a drawn tube is the first portion that goes into it. After the tuning slide, we come into the valve section. And Cliff has made his valve sections uh, the traditional way here with a whole bunch of knuckles. These knuckles we make in-house and we manufacture the casings as well in order for all those little pieces and parts to line up well and predictably. So these are all the parts that go into that. It's brought together in a fixture hand assembled, and then brazed with high temperature silver braze in order to bring in all those materials together, all those parts together and lock them in. From there you can finish those and you result in very, very tight fillets of silver through those, those knuckles and such. I just love the look of that silver on brass on those, uh, on those joints and it results in a very solid core, massive core of the horn. After those knuckles are cut out on the inside, the balusters are put together. This is an example of a two-piece valve casing where that upper baluster and the valve casing itself are two separate parts. And so those are brought together at this point. At this point, the pistons are not fitted. And so the inside is a rough cut or a rough uh, reamed size. We fit pistons at the, at the very end. The slides are built one at a time on the horn. Now the placement of the knuckles is very consistent from the fixture, and so the slides come out very consistent compared one to the next. However, the slide is built to fit on that horn. And so the result is a slide that's perfect, as opposed to having the horn assembled on one fixture and a slide assembled on another fixture, both with their respective tolerances having to be brought together. This way the horn is built as a master, those tubes that you see there, and then the slide is built on that master, and so you get a slide and a, and a valve body that is perfectly well fit. And as a result of having those built together and honed together, we find that the slides work very, very, very smoothly, 
and uh, without hiccups and very reliably. This approach Cliff did because he didn't have the fixtures at the time. And so as a result, with that constraint, he was able to come up with a different process that resulted in slides that were better than a match set coming off of fixtures. Now from there, we have the lead pipe and the tuning slide and that valve section and the slides all assembled. This is all without fixtures. And so the wire clamp you have there is just to keep it from falling off before there is some solder, but it's not forced fit onto there. It is just resting. And then you have the horn body with fitted valve guides and the slides. The next part is where Cliff and I started when we first were having our conversations about doing Blackburn trumpets. It's the bell. The bell is the most difficult and the most tedious and um, frankly the most unpredictable portion of building a trumpet. Everything up until this point has been somewhat mechanical. Right? These are machine parts, these are uh, small form parts like the lead pipe, small forms, very predictable. A bell, not so much. You'd go through a whole lot of iterations and mechanical operations in order to get the bell to be a bell. The first thing we start with here is taking a flat blank and forming it over so that we can seam it. These are one-piece bells, and so it's got a seam that goes from the bell tail, or the small end, all the way out to the flare. Here Cliff is bringing those, those two seams together and hammering it together slowly. From there, after that seam is lined up without any tabs, it's just fit in there by hand all the way down. Cliff goes through and he uh, high temperature brazes this seam, again by hand. This was probably the most difficult portion of, of the process because it's, it's very, as you can see, it's very hand and eye coordination on looking for the right temperature and making sure that you don't get it too hot and making sure that it's not too cold and the braze not flowing. And the frustration early on was that Cliff would make it look so easy. He would just run that torch right up that seam and that seam would be just beautiful. So once that seam is in place, the rest of it is about material moving. So like I said with the earlier in the, in the stamping of mouthpieces, that is moving material. And with bell making, it's all about moving that material to where you want it to go. So the first is just through traditional pegging. Every time you hit that bell, that material moves a little bit. And so repeated, repeated hammering and repeated forming is how we get that bell to go to where we want it to be. As we move this metal around, we also remember that we have to do the bell stem. So the bell stem is produced by a drawing operation, very similar to the lead pipe, where it's the bell is over a form mandrel that is determining the bell shape, and it's being pushed through a compliant die in order to bring that tail down onto that steel. Now that can only be done to a certain point, and so as you see in this picture, you've got basically three quarters of the bell having been brought down onto that mandrel. We did not remove any mandrel or remove any metal. We just moved the metal down onto the mandrel. In order to get the rest of it down, we do a process called bell spinning. Spinning with obviously the bell being spun and this blunt nose tip is pushing the material down onto that metal. As Cliff goes along here in short little steps, we are gently pushing that metal down onto the mandrel. The result then is you're moving the metal to the shape that you want that is determined by that mandrel. So now the bell is pretty much completed in terms of its shape. The last aspect is the bead and this bead has been uh, brought about through lots of experimentation through the years of course through all manufacturers. Our bead generally has a steel wire wrapped up inside of that little part there. You can also have a brass bead or a brass wire put inside of there, or you can have no wire. Each one of those contributes heavily to how the bell resonates and how the bell sounds, and it comes very much down to personal preference as well as a little bit of projection. Each of those materials vibrates differently, and at this point in the bell, the bell is really moving quite a bit, and so it affects how the intonation works in terms of what harmonics are being reflected and how the whole instrument is vibrating. Now the last part of this is putting all those pieces and parts together. And so in the previous picture we had the lead pipe and the valve section and the slides created. And now we are applying the Z braces and such in order to attach the bell to the horn. Now the placement of these Z braces can affect 
what a horn sounds like and what its intonation is perceived as. Not so much that it's changing the actual intonation, but more likely it is applying uh, pressure points or constraints to certain nodes and anti-nodes in a horn. And as a result, you accentuate or you dampen certain harmonics of the sound. So you do get a change in the sound, but also given that those harmonics are not perfectly in tune uh, on the majority of, of instruments, you are emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain harmonics. And then as a result, the leftover harmonics that we do here may or may not be in the intonation. So as we discuss brace placement, whether it's on like tuning slides where you see a cross brace, or the brace between the lower tube of the third slide and the, the parts of the tuning slide, or the Z braces, those can affect significantly how a horn can sound and its character. Each manufacturer has its own approach to this. Uh, my goal at the beginning in 2016 uh, was to reproduce what Cliff was doing in order to maintain the sound and the response and the intonation that people have come to appreciate with the Blackburn trumpets. At this point, we do fit the pistons. The pistons are made in-house now. We have a Monel material, which we find works very well. They're handmade and hand-fitted and then hand-lapped into place. And so the finished horn is then play-tested extensively at this point. And we also certainly look for all the cosmetic flaws and any issues like that that we can address. Horns then are silver-plated. Uh, we utilize Anderson silver plating up in Elkhart. Anderson has been a fabulous partner for us for years and years on mouthpieces and continue to be as much for trumpets. The quality is, is second to none and we're always pleased to see a horn when it comes back and it's, it's shiny, it's beautiful. Um, it never looks better than when it comes out there. So that's a little bit of our background, uh, a little bit of our manufacturing and design philosophy on mouthpieces and then a brief overview of the Blackburn trumpet portion as well. It's, like I said before, it's uh, always a special opportunity to visit any manufacturer in order to see how all these things are done in person, to, to feel how they're done in person, and to see each little individual step and the care uh, and attention to detail that it takes to bring this together. You know, making mouthpieces, I always joke, is easy. You're only making one part. Whereas a trumpet, it's like 100 parts, and you have to make all 100 parts, and you have to get them all put together correctly in order for the instrument to be uh, what it was intended to be. So it's been a journey, uh, just like everybody's career and musical journey uh, and musical career and such. It's, uh, it's an adventure, and we have our days just like everybody. But at the end of the day, when you see a horn like this or you get to hear a player come in and play, uh, it's, it's very special, and we should all remember how lucky we are to be in a, a discipline and an industry that has art as its centerpiece, whether it's musical art, whether it's visual art, uh, or composing. All the art that goes into our industry is something that is very special, and we are reminded here daily in what we get to do. It's a privilege to work with musicians. It's a privilege to create instruments from scratch. It's a privilege to bring these things to light uh, together with artists and with players of all ages in order to uh, create something that wasn't there before. So if you do get a chance to visit us, please do. We're in Lexington, Kentucky, and we are open again and cruising along and looking forward to brighter days ahead. And we look forward to the rest of ITG, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and seeing you again soon. Thank you.